start the session. And I just want to make sure that uh, our speaker is here. Uh, Dr. Wonje Lee, are you here? Yes, I'm here. Nice to meet you again. Hi, thank you so much. Okay, that, there you are, yeah. And then, uh, let me just say a few words before I invite our speaker this afternoon. Uh, I would like to uh, thank the NPOs and all other, uh, the, our uh, partners from the Ministry of Health, the health officials. And uh, this is a continuation of our initiative on the health sector. We, have, uh, we had one presentation uh, from Japan the last time, uh, Dr. Uh, Yosh, uh, Yoshio Uetsuka, and that he presented the Japan experience in handling the COVID-19 pandemic. Now, the purpose of this that we are inviting Dr. Won J. Lee is that so we can share with you the experience of Korea. And uh, as you know, Korea has or was, was actually in the beginning, uh, the beginning when the pandemic started, one of the countries that was uh, suddenly had a very high case uh, in the beginning. So at that time, uh, in fact, Dr. Won J. Lee has uh, was with us through what we call the top talk session when he spoke with uh, the uh, secretary Nograles of the uh, of the Philippines. Uh, so I'm, I'm very pleased to invite again Dr. Won J. Lee. He is now the assistant professor uh, in uh, the, the Seoul National University uh, Bundang Hospital. And then uh, he has been very much engaged in the uh, in the pandemic and also uh, he will also with, will, will share with us what not only what the Korea experience, but what can the university offer to us. So this can be hopefully a consideration, an option for the member countries. So on that note, may I invite Dr. Wonjeli uh, to start the session, please. Dr. Lee, over to Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. <laughs> uh, first, it is my honor to be here and uh, it's a great honor to um, share my, our uh, experience, but at the same time, as Mr. Secretary mentioned, um, it won't be just uh, how we have uh, fought with COVID-19, but also how the system that we have, uh, have been supporting uh, to make this possible. So, and at the end, if, if we have some more time, I'd like to share what kind of educational program that we have and we're ready to share. So uh, I'm gonna do my slide screen uh, share now and start the presentation. Okay, so uh, basically today's content will be start with the uh, sort of national system that how to fight with COVID-19 and I move on to details of our in-hospital management. And then I'm gonna uh, share how our hospital system were able to support this uh, and touch a little bit on health-based economy, which is a big issue these days, and if I have some time, uh, or during our discussion, uh, to share some of uh, our education uh, programs. So this is sort of a current situation in Korea. Um, after first confirmed, confirmed case in January 19th, we actually had a pretty huge outbreak in February. Uh, we call it Shincheonji outbreak. It's an outbreak from a cult church. And then there was almost 1,000 cases a day. And uh, it was uh, quite um, tragic. But luckily, uh, we have uh, managed to um, decrease the number of cases. And around the April, actually, we actually had some days that we did not have any cases. However, after that, we had uh, 30, 50 of those cases throughout the summer. Uh, but at, at the end of summer, we sort of have a second surge here and around 400 cases. So we had to raise the uh, social distancing level. And we had a, about a month later now, we are again down to 50 to 100 cases a day. So, so far we have done more than 2 million tests and we have about 24,000 confirmed cases of which uh, 400 deceased. Um, so this is how uh, we are doing right now. Uh, at the moment. So 
how all this possible? So to begin with, I'd like to just show very uh, simple chart of how Korean healthcare system works. Basically, we have universal care, meaning uh, government is providing national health insurance service. So all the people in Korea are under this system, so they can all get universal care. But interesting is that um, the more than 90% of medical care institutions, so-called providers, are, are private, so that um, they are driving efficiency with high quality, and they're uh, uh, providing each access to our people. And at the same time, since it's this mandatory subscription, government holds very strong power over this private sector. So while government holding all the um, control power over Korean healthcare system, but actually who are running this system is private, who also want to drive if, wants efficiency and high quality. So basically when outbreak like COVID-19 happens, our CDC is usually under the control of Minister of Health, but um, as soon as this go, uh, low level goes to red, then uh, we set up national disaster and safety status control center and prime minister will control this, uh, will be control tower and whole system comes under this and uh, work together. So what we did was that um, with the ha happening of COVID-19, just in a month, we had a more than 600 spots around the country for screening centers. And you can see here, these are also actually all the private sector who has set up these um, screening centers. And also you all know about drive-through screening. Uh, it, it's very convenient, but at the same time, it limits exposure of front-end workers as well as the patients too. So very efficient, very fast and safe. And we have about 70 spots across country. And the other thing that was very important to fight COVID-19 that we had very uh, fast introduction of diagnostic kit, which has enabled us for fast tracking and testing. So one of our private companies went three weeks and through this expedited approval process, we were able to use this just one week. So um, at the end of February, actually we have, were able to do more than 20,000 tests per day, just more than enough to just cover our entire population. So having this very fast uh, and accurate diagnosis tool, what we were able to do was that we could do fast and thorough contact tracing. And then that leads to testing as well. So basically using GPS, DUR, credit debit card user data, using all of this, we identify the patient movement so that we can identify who are potential people who might have contacted this patient so that we could um, select them and test them and if necessary, isolate them. I understand there is definitely a um, privacy issue, but I just want to say that this is not just, uh, this is done under the Infectious Disease Control and Prevention Act, which was set after MERS era. Of course, we restructured medical facility. I mentioned that 90% are actually private hospitals. So, but we do have public hospitals. So government quickly transformed this public for COVID-19, so-called National Infection Control Hospitals. But at the same time, in time of this uh, pandemic, what's more important is that we should maintain routine uh, clinical. This is done. Pardon? So we were able to do our uh, maintain our routine clinic practice by using uh, what we call safe hospitals. I'm going to go into detail later. So, and also we had to have more negative pressure facilities. And the other thing is that in time of crisis like this. Medical systems are often overwhelmed because um, there are so many patients and they, we just cannot hold all of them in our hospital. But we have set up something called community treatment center. This is non-medical facility. And this is a picture. So basically our, one of, um, a lot of our private sector corporate provide the facility. And then this was used for mild COVID-19 patient. So basically, um, who are not uh, very severe, but still RT-PCR positive, they, don't, they need isolation. Or patients who have co comorbidities, but their symptoms are mild so that they don't need to go to hospital, but needs isolation. All of these patients were sent to this community treatment center. So this is one example. Um, this is our hospital, SNUBH. Um, so this is our uh, commanding center in our hospital. And this is operating center in the, um, the, uh, the community tumor center. So through telecommunication, we are able to provide patient care if necessary. So basically we have this system. 
if um, they have a, they're diagnosed with COVID-19 have symptoms, they are put to public or private hospitals. If they have very clinic unstable situations, they're gonna to send to our tertiary hospital like uh, SNUBH, where we have high level isolation units. If they get better, they're gonna step down and they're gonna send to this non-medical facility until uh, their RT-PCR negative. So one example, how uh, I talked about the Sinchonji Church occult uh, at the center outbreak at the very beginning, we had about thousand cases a, a day of, at the peak and it was all over the news. What we did is that we set a control tower right away. So our prime minister actually went down to this Daegu Gyeongbuk area and we had a rapid response team so that we could do very fast decision making and implementation by having all the ministry uh, people in the support team. Um, medical facility was uh, transformed only for the COVID-19. Uh, of course, we need more people. So this was sort of a local uh, outbreak. So other part of country doctors just came down to the area to help all the medical personnel uh, to in Daegu. So actually we had more than thousand volunteers for all the country to help with Daegu Gyeongbuk area. So we, yes, we did have strict social distancing, but we did not have any lockdown or anything like that. Well, so this is, I just gathered this picture. So, you know, all the healthcare workers were doing great job, but at the same time, there were a lot of support from other part of country, mask and PPEs and money, food, everything was sent to this area to help these people. So I just wanna emphasize that government leadership is very important, but they just cannot do the job on their own. Definitely private sector support is mandatory and most important of all, civic awareness, very, very important. Uh, I will move on to our hospital system. So basically uh, our hospital is called safe hospital. So what we do is that we isolate patient respiratory symptoms from other patients or entire care process. So we do isolate COVID-19 patient, but we maintain our routine care. So you can see this is our main buildings. So outside our building, we have the COVID-19 clinic. It's outside our building. And this is ED triage in front of our ER. And we do have isolation unit in our hospital. So how do they work? So this is just a simple flow chart. But I just wanna say one thing, whoever comes into our hospital will be screened at the hospital entrance or in front of ER. And if they're suspect of anything, they're gonna send to be screened. So um, this is uh, just an example of our process. So whoever who are scheduled for the visit to our hospital, then we are gonna send them a URL code to uh, via SMS, or they can just go into our homepage. So they can fill up their questionnaire. If they questionnaire and there's nothing wrong, they're gonna get QR code pass. And when they enter our hospital, they're gonna use our QR scanner. If they have no problem, they're gonna pass. But if there is a concern, they're gonna to have to contact our uh, screening center. And at the entrance, we're gonna check their body temper by facial rec recognition. So this is an example. This is our hospital lobby. Whoever comes in will get QR code and then after entering here, the QR code scanner and temperature check. If there's no problem, they're gonna pass. If they have some problem, they're gonna either send to 19 clinic or uh, ED trials, or we, they're gonna have to contact our infection control team. So this is a picture of our QR code. If they're, they're no problem, blue. If they're a problem, they're gonna be red sign. And this is me checking my uh, body temperature saying I'm, uh, I'm okay. So this is uh, our kiosk. Um, and then a little detail for our COVID-19 clinic. So I said it's set outside of our hospital. So we have two clinics and x-ray and waiting rooms here, and they're all equipped with negative pressure. And our ER, we, I said uh, there is a ED triage right in front of our ER, and this is 24 hour screening center for high risk patient. And all suspected patients are, goes to the this suspected area. And this is we, where we have isolation unit, but if not, there are no suspicion, no symptom, bottom, okay, no um, epidemiologic risk. They can just go into our routine ER and they can get care. And on admission, we have a three areas for to manage COVID-19 patient. Uh, first is high level isolation unit where we put severe confirmed cases COVID-19 who needs, might need ICU care. Or we have a word for a confirmed mild cases. 
And there are times when people are highly suspicious of COVID-19, but they're not confirmed, but they need other medical attention, then we put them in preemptive isolation unit. So this is a picture of a high-level isolation unit. Actually, after MERS, government have supported uh, many private hospitals and public hospitals to be equipped with uh, this negative pressure unit to fight with new emerging uh, infection disease like MERS, Ebola, right now COVID-19. So we already we already had this kind of facility even before happening COVID-19. So as soon as this happened, we'll able to fight this more effectively. So um, this is some, a picture of our high level ISO units, the center of monitoring. Uh, we have very big room so that ECMO or CRRT uh, or, or even OP can be delivered in this area. This is P the pictures PP donning and doffing area. And as the number of confirmed patients increased, we had to use another word. So we basically uh, use negative pressure machines to convert ordinary room to negative pressure room like this. And I, I explained earlier, if there are patients who are, has very high risk but not confirmed, then we're gonna put them here. Or if they have high epidemiological risk, but they're asymptomatic, but still they came to for chest pain, abdominal pain, and they need uh, admission, then during the incubation period for, for observation, we have them here. So basically we have all the system that separate uh, who are suspicious, suspected or confirmed cases are isolated from the rest of people coming to our hospital. So having said that, uh, having all this system in place, our actually face-to-face -face consultation was not changed. So um, consultation time, same, setting is same. Only difference being all the doctors, all the patients are all wearing masks. And other than that, there was actually no change. And we do have final check-in process. So basically using uh, DUR alert uh, uh, by the information uh, supported by CDC, uh, if they have a terrible history to major operating country or uh, contact history of confirmed cases, we will have an alert. And if they have some symptoms, we're gonna to have to contact uh, infection team. And then for the management of our in-hospital staff, uh, we have been using electronic questionnaires every day. So every morning we get this messaging and we put in our symptom status or uh, our history of uh, visiting some places. And also if there is some other uh, instructions, we send out uh, all the, our healthcare workers instruction messages. And this is our cafeteria for the lunch or dinner. You see the blocking panels here. So we will we are able to minimize any uh, chance of uh, transmission. And all the conferences and meetings are converted to teleconferencing right now. Of course, we have provided more broader population of hospital staff with PPE. So everybody are now very familiar with using how to use PPE. And also we're doing simulations all the time. Um, for CPR or transportation like this. So now uh, just a little bit off from COVID-19, but move on to how all these were uh, possible. And I want to share some of aspect of our hospital system. So basically, uh, so National Liberty Bundang Hospital is a teaching or tertiary hospital. Um, we are regional emergency medical center as well. And the type of ownership is semi-public government entity. So we actually opened our hospital in 2003 as a general hospital. And then we uh, expanded in 2013, we opened new building uh, focusing cancer and neuroscience. So now we have around 1300 beds right now. And we also have a research facility like Healthcare Innovation Park, uh, which a private and our academic people work together. And we also have a preclinical lab, which we have the biosafe level three. This is our uh, house mission. Basically our vision is lead a standard and build a trust. Uh, and the core value I wanna focus on is that patient center is actually one of the best, uh, most important core value that we uh, think about. Uh, today, uh, some numbers, we have around 5,000 staffs, more than 800 doctors. 1700 uh, nurses. And we have about uh, 1300 beds right now. Um, I wanna say that I told you we opened in 2003. So when we opened uh, at the beginning, our outpatient was only like 1500. But as you can see by 1800, 
we now having more than 7,000 7, uh, outpatient visits per day, and annual growth was about 10%. Hospital people have grown annually 66 .6, and now every term of hospitalization by days were uh, about eight days, but now it's down to 6.5 days. And now we are doing more than one, 170 cases of surgery per day. Um, not just having this facility, but what's possible is that we have very broad spectrum of clinical excellence, minimal invest surgery. So for example, ovarian cancer, we are doing single incision laparoscope surgery for 90% of cases colorectal cancer, we're doing more than 90% in a preservation rate and our five-year survival rate colorectal cancer is the best, not among the Korea, but among a lot of, compared to many other countries around the uh, globe. And lung cancer, uh, we have highest survival rate for stage one cancer, and we're doing only cancer surgery by vets for 90%. So, and for the, uh, we have three dimension robots and we're have world-class fiber survival rate for prostatic cancer uh, post surgery as well. And this is just one example. Um, this is Dr. Kim, he's a world a famous gastric surgeon. We are the first hospital to perform more than 500 cases of laparoscopic gastric surgeon in the world. And we do not have any death for complications till now. So having this clinical excellence, well, a lot of hospitals have this clinical excellence, especially like Europe or America, Japan, or in our uh, Southeast Asian countries. We, I know that there are a lot of hospitals who has very good doctors and clinical excellence, but that's not what we all that we have. We are actually the world first hospital to um, work, uh, open a digital hospital, and we are not using any papers at the moment, EMR, PACS, OCS, and paperless. And actually, we are the first hospital outside of the US to achieve the highest level for EMR system, which is HIM stage seven. And you can see these Arab people are using our system. So we actually export the system to Saudi Arabia and United States. So basically our overview, uh, our central system, and this is all connected, uh, our uh, computers and all the uh, packs and system. So what we can do is that having this all the system, we can use mobile EMR, we have a VDI system, electronic dashboard, um, a lot of clinical support and patient information sent to patient and they can see their uh, status as well. This is just some example. So actually all the people who come into our hospital wears this wristband. So whenever um, their drug is administered or they do tests, all the time they're gonna check this uh, wristband by these uh, PDF machines. And then we check there whether they're correct or mismatched to minimize any sort of mistaken mistake. And again, uh, this is some example, our smart patient guide. Uh, this is a virtual location guide and all the payment are done actually, uh, not all, but uh, to help, uh, we have payment for the a kiosk and automatic check-in is also possible. So having this uh, EMR and all the uh, smart hospital system, we're increasing patient convenience, also enhancing effectiveness and simplifying our administration work, which all can now then use to, for the patient safety and uh, clinical excellence. Now I wanna move on to our hospital, uh, very good system. So we have system for continued quality improvement. So basically our CEO is actually medical director for our QI and under him, we have two com uh, committee, quality improvement committee and also patient sa safety committee. So our QI committee, we have 10 physicians and 15 full-time employees. And having these uh, teams, we are doing a lot of work to improve improvement continuously. And for patient safety management, we have patient safety committee. Uh, and this purpose is that to discuss patient safety related issues with multidisciplinary teams. So basically in the patient safety committee, we have various department and people from uh, people from various department and position. So here, see this the hat is actually cardiologist, but um, we have uh, ER people, hematology, infection, neurology, all the uh, other department in here. Of course, a nursing department, pharmacist, and um, imaging department, um, facility. So basically, 
for the patient safety, all, all the people in our department gather together and discuss and make direction for patient safety. And we also have something called TOPS team. This is taken patient safety. Um, this is also very multidisciplinary team. You can just can see here, nurses, physicians, all the other uh, people. We have around 50 staff working for this patient safety as well. And also we are checking our indicators. So um, we have a lot of indicators, but uh, currently we are managing 65 indicators right now. So, and then every uh, quarter we check them. So 40 are uh, related clinical, 11 are safety issues and 14 are management. So what we do is that uh, this is a 2000 example of 2019, um, the first quarter. So green is that we achieved and yellow is we're doing observation and this red are something needs improvement. So we check our mandatory indicators every quarter. And then if there is a yellow or red light, we're gonna have discussion and find a way to improvement. Uh, this is just, a, uh, I just wanted to show, I, I'm sorry that these are Korean, but this is how it works. So I'll just give you a, one example. So this is a fall down rate, fall down rate. And then this is the, uh, under the control of our a responsible department is that um, the uh, management team and the goal is 1.2 per day. And what happened 2018, 1.00, 1.00, fine, fine. It went down to 0 0.092, but at the second quarter, it went 1.23. So when this happens, our committee sets up TFT and to tackle uh, the problem. Um, just uh, this soar rate. You see, we're doing good, but had red light, then we're gonna have set a, a TF team. And you can see that after a few months, it comes back to the lower level again. So we constantly checking these kinds of indicators more than 60 every day, uh, every quarter, and uh, try to improve if necessary. And we just do not do this in house. So we have tracking all the indicators and everything. But now what we are doing is that starting in 2000, I think it was 18, we have published something called outcomes book. I know that this is already very uh, much done in United States and other countries, but we are the first hospital in Korea to publish our outcomes uh, to public. So basically you can just go in our website and you can just see them. So uh, we have around now more than uh, about 400 indicators that we check and follow and we publish the result and share with our public. This is a, a um, example. So we have English version as well. So if you go into our website, you can always check how we are doing. So for example, if you click lung cancer and you can see a 30 day post operative mortality rate and you can see it's very, very low these days and even zero in uh, past few years. And this is open to public and uh, this is uh, shared by everyone. So now I'd like to uh, finalize my talk talking about uh, health-based economy. So I think many of you already know this concept. So economy now, the important healthcare is uh, more important. I mean, uh, I think there is, it's just the most important part of our economy right now. So not just traditional healthcare industries expanding, but also non-healthcare industry are entering to our border and the growing proportion of healthcare industry in national economy is robust. So now it's really hard to talk up, not talk about healthcare, we are talking about economy. And how, what's the impact? In a typical year, poor healthcare cost the global economy, for example, 5% productivity loss, 15% of GDP and there's 43 days per person loss to poor health and premature deaths. So the impact is huge. But if we revert that, if we can improve that, what happens is that we can have more than 12 trillion by 2014 GDP impact. So, and what's more important is that 70% actually can come from prevention. So the impact of healthcare is, is actually enormous and more than important than anything. And actually, it's not just statistics now we are facing right now. You know, the global COVID-19 status is um, not very good. 
Now there is more than 23 million cases. And I know death toll is, I think, now reaching probably 1 million by now. And air trouble, more than half is dramatically dropped. But how do you see the impact here? World GDP growth rate. OECD think that around six, I am at five. So, and even single bit growth here, nine, seven, this is very, very um, tragic situation right now. And we see that how healthcare is so important to the economy. Well, uh, projection for 2000 well, looks good, but we really never know how this will turn out. So we know that cases of um, COVID-19 will decrease as time goes by, uh, but we never know how it's gonna be in the GDP impact. Optimal scenario, yes, it will go up and just come back, but we never know if you do not do the job well, it will just drop like this and we may never get out of it. So my conclusion, um, strong healthcare system is essential to improve the productivity in the era of health-based economy and especially COVID-19, I think you are all aware and you all agree with this. And I think that so healthcare system can be achieved through cooperation through public and private sector together. Public government sector sets the direction, but at the same time, private sector will drive innovation and maximize efficiency. And I think smart hospital like that we have in our, in our uh, SNUBH will be the future to drive efficiency and safety of hospital system. And I think, uh, and I want to say that we are ready to share our knowledge and experience. And if I have some more time, I'm gonna uh, share my uh, slide later on after having q and So um, before finalizing my talk, I think when I very first met with APO um, and then had a talk, I talked about mask and then uh, back then I was not able to emphasize too much because by then WH was not talking about mask and but right now it's totally different. Um, a lot of experts around the country, even US now are saying how important mask. And I think this is one of the most important factor that we were able to uh, maintain this number of uh, new cases in Korea. So mask actually save lives. And I think uh, I just wanna emphasize again. Um, so I have appendix right now here, but uh, I'm gonna uh, put uh, my mic to uh, Mr. Secretary, and if I some time later, I'm going to share some of slides. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Dr. Lee. And uh, let me uh, thank you for the uh, very informative presentation. And there are a number of key points that we can uh, get uh, from uh, your. Uh, uh, from your presentation, one is at the national level. When you talk at the national level, we are talking that uh, how we deal, you know, with this overwhelmed capacity, and that uh, the government alone cannot do it. So one of the solution in the experience of Korea was the, uh, the uh, partnership with the private sectors. And you added to that actually the civic awareness as well. And uh, a concrete example is the repurposing of the hospitals, but then still you have the command center through the teleconference. Uh, so uh, there are a number of other things at the national level that are important, but uh, I think it will be, uh, it was also very, very uh, insightful when you share the experience of the hospital, the uh, your hospital, and uh, you have kindly uh, explained uh, not only how uh, you maintain actually the business, but in fact, uh, the journey toward excellence. And here is what is relevant to our member countries, because it, we are talking about the capability of the hospital, of the medical institutions. And uh, with that note, perhaps I would like uh, to invite uh, the viewers, our colleagues from the NPOs and our uh, partners uh, to ask questions uh, to Dr. Lee uh, relating to what he has presented. We will come back later on to Dr. Lee uh, to add what uh, the hospital 
may or, or are, is prepared to offer to the member countries specifically. So at this point of time, I would like to open the floor for questions, for clarifications to Dr. Lee, please. You may speak because it, the, the uh, screen is a bit small. But otherwise, let me just start the discussion with Dr. Lee uh, on a few indicators that you mentioned. You, uh, for example, the case in Korea you mentioned is about 50 to 100. Is that, is that Seoul or is that in the country uh, as a whole? I, I would like to relate to the case in uh, Japan, uh, in Tokyo alone. Uh, uh, the, uh, daily is still about uh, 200. That is in Tokyo. Japan in total is about 866. And uh, you mentioned also in the case of Korea about the testing, yeah, the testing, uh, because I see that the numbers actually came out also because of the testing. Uh, I, 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 I have the statistic of other member countries and the case in a number of our member countries, the case of infection is still large. In, in a few uh, uh, countries of the APO member countries. How, how would you uh, uh, comment on this about the rate? Because I have, in, say in Japan, I have not, I don't recall it has ever reached to a single dig digit for a very, very long time. It stays around 200. What, will, what is your view on that, Dr. Ali, please? So uh, the number I share is a total in Korea. Total in Korea, okay. Total in Korea. Of course, a uh, higher proportion is uh, um, in uh, Seoul or Gyeonggi province, but still it's a uh, total. So I don't know the daily numbers, but the uh, Seoul probably account for probably 30%, I guess. And the uh, rest of uh, 30 to 30% 30 will be Gyeong Gyeonggi province and rest will be the across country. So now, you know, the number is over hundred. It really depends on if there is a one place that have a, like, a, let's say um, the hospitals where uh, all the people just, uh, they stay and uh, one outbreak happens and number just goes up. And then if that resolves, the number goes down. So it's about 50 to hundred uh, across country these days. Um, so I think um, 800 it's, well, compared to other countries, it's, it's not that big number, but I think unless if you really uh, want to break down number to like less than 100 or so, and Japan is a big country. I know this population is more than double compared to Korea. So then you, the country will need actually very strict social distancing if they want to decrease the, the rate, because you know that this has very, a lot of patients have asymptomatic. So actually many are asymptomatic and but they can still transmit the disease. So even I really don't know whether I have been infected or COVID-19 or not until I do antibody tests. But anyway, if people seem asymptomatic, they still can infect the disease. So um, it's really, unless we do pretty long time, like uh, 10 or 12, 12 uh, two weeks of very strict social distancing, it won't be able to decrease number down to like 100. Thank you, Dr. Lee. Uh, any, anybody from our, uh, from our friends would like to ask questions? I have uh, you know, a, a number of from the medical institutions. Anybody from Bangladesh, from uh, India, or from Iran would like to ask questions, please? You are most welcome. Thank you, SG. Uh, and thank you, Mr. Lee, for your report. Uh, I was wondering, uh, you are talking about uh, living people, but how do you handle the dead people? Uh, Mokaven, 
can you be more specific? What 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 do you mean uh, yeah. by handling those who pass away yeah, because of the wrong. COVID? Is it the yeah, how you, because yeah. uh, uh, in Iran we are separate graveyard mm. for the dead people and uh, okay. uh, regular dead people. And how do you handle in Korea in this situation from the hospital to graveyard? Thank okay, you. so. Thank you. Thank you for the question. So basically, we do not have that many, well, many, but uh, compared to other countries, the number is not big. So, uh, so far, um, let me just pull out the data again. So far, we have uh, about 400 cases who have died from COVID-19. So what we do is that if there are confirmed the cases and they, they die in the hospital, uh, we do not allow patient contact the uh, that person, but we do not have separate grave or, or anything like that. We take it as usual, but the thing is that we separate the contact from people who uh, uh, like family members, but we do not have any separate uh, things like that. Is that, that answer your question, Bokhaven? Yeah, well, uh, I think we are doing more advanced in this case. Yes, I, I agree. Yeah. There's a lot of people, um, the people, I think definitely you, we're going to need those kind of system to really separate them. But luckily for us, we, uh, the number we are under control. Thank you for your insight. Any other questions, please? Ivan has a speed question. If you okay, let's see. Uh, may I ask you to repeat the question, please? We missed the question. Are you good? Hello, everybody. Hello, everybody. I'm Hello. Yes, can you repeat the question? You are muted. Yeah, okay. Uh, I want to know that how was the impact of uh, a smart patient guide in managing COVID-19 in Korea. Uh, the, the impact of uh, what? Impact of role of uh, a smart patient guide that you have uh, in managing COVID-19 patients. So uh, if understood uh, the question correctly, are you talking about who um, who have mild symptoms but have COVID-19 or are you talking about young patients who have COVID-19? No, you have a, a system of a smart patient guide, yes, in your hospitals. Dr. Lee, I think she is talking about the guidelines in the hospital in handling. Ah, if they are COVID positive. Okay, so uh, yeah. basically, Okay, so basically um, we try to, I mean, minimize, we cannot completely shut down, we can minimize having COVID-19 patient uh, mixed with our normal patient. So I've shown that at the, at the entrance gate and the ER and screening centers, we will separate them from the um, normal, so-called no COVID-19 negative patient. But still, yes, there is chance that people are asymptomatic and their epidemic risk is not high. So they just uh, enter the hospital, but it's possible that they're COVID-19 and you are right. There is possibly that they may transmit COVID-19 in our hospital, right? So what we do is that whenever a patient shows symptom, and yes, definitely we do the COVID-19 right away. And in six hours, we can get the RT-PCR results. So we do test right away. And uh, yes, there was some incidents happening like that. So patient actually was asymptomatic at the admission and she was, uh, came into our hospital who has a chest pain. So, but anyway, she had a fever. So we confirmed COVID-19 case. What we do is that we have guidelines. We shut down the whole, uh, the entire the general ward that the patient was in. We, we do cohort isolation. And then by uh, checking all the cameras and pathway of patient, we identify contact staff. And then we isolate them for, we do test for them, but even their test negative because their possibility of uh, incubation period, we separate them for, for uh, two weeks. That's our policy right now. 
Okay, thank you. Thank you, Aliput. Any other question from other countries? Can I ask a question, SG? Yes, please, David. Yeah, uh, actually, uh, I would like to ask, uh, you know, Indonesia has quite a high number of victims of COVID-19. Uh, the one that worried me, actually, uh, the victim is not only uh, citizens, but also doctors, nurses, and, you know, all the people related to the hospital. So uh, do you have that kind of problem in Korea or do you have any suggestion for us to, you know, minimize the victims uh, regarding the doctors and nurses because they are the one always closely related to the patient with COVID-19? Thank you. Yes. I mean, that's very, I mean, that's a very important and good question. Thank you. So um, uh, since we had a, uh, ample PPEs because we, after Mercy Era, all the hospitals and even private sector hospitals were actually prepared with this PPE. So when this COVID-19 outbreak happened, we had a pretty much ample amount of uh, enough PPE. So we were able to protect ourselves. So basically first, definitely we, if we want to protect healthcare workers and professionals, wearing PPE is the most important. But second thing is I've mentioned about civic awareness a little bit, um, but the thing is if patient actually lies, you know, like um, let's say um, they've been to very high risk area and they might have some symptoms, but they come in when they contact these doctors and they talk about it and they just hide their, their history and doctor not knowing anything about them and then they get may infected. So, but yes, some patients are doing that in Korea has been doing that, but most cases, people do not do that. So basically, just civic awareness is actually very, very important. So in Korea now, wherever you go, public places, everybody is wearing masks. And in hospital, we are uh, obliged to wear masks all the time, not just in the consultation room, but moving around the hospital, we all have to wear a uh, mask. I think that really helped us a lot. And plus, civic awareness will be most important uh, to protect healthcare workers. So far, um, well, as far as I know, there was one doctor who were uh, diagnosed with COVID-19 because of the, uh, I think he got transmission from the patient. There was only one case. And other than that, we did not have any problem for healthcare workers. Thank you. Uh, Abigail, you wanted to ask a question? Hi, doctor, I'm from Malaysia. So uh, my question is that, um, what are the government's um, assistance uh, in terms of local hospitals or clinics uh, for swab tests? Like in Malaysia, we have uh, local hospitals or several clinics. They offer free swab tests for people who are underprivileged or you know, uh, lower than the uh, income rate. Um, so I was wondering, um, is the government assisting this in Korea? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so uh, basically Korea is under the universal healthcare system. And uh, for the uh, suspected case COVID-19, uh, patient get them for free. So if the local hospital do the test for these people, then they will get reimbursed from the uh, government. But uh, so that's how a government is supporting. And there are cases when there is no high suspicion, but patient wants um, COVID-19 that then it's out of pocket. But if they're highly suspicious uh, and then government, uh, doctor thinks that patient need COVID-19 that then it's gonna be free and this will be reimbursed by the government. Whether it was done in private sector or public sector, doesn't matter. Thank you, Dr. Lee. At this point, can you, can, may I invite you to continue, uh, you know, the remaining part of the presentation? Uh, well, uh, just to share with everyone, uh, what else actually overall that the, your uh, university hospital may be able to offer? Thank you, um, Mr. Secretary. Just just uh, just few slides just to share um, what we can we have been done and just you know share how what, what, how we can help. So basically, we have uh, uh, a lot of doctors from around the around the globe, a lot of from Russia and countries and uh, also in Asia. So we basically provide 
oper operational observation and examination, and also hands-on practice using simulators, and of course, expert meetings. Um, you can see we lecture for medical IT and HIS. We have a parties, and you see they can come into our animal lab, and then they can do a procedure together. But now, because of the COVID-19, it's not possible. Um, uh, before that, um, this is some more pictures. Uh, so these are uh, actually, I think these are uh, Moscow doctors, uh, a lot of from uh, Hospital 52. We, yes, we do provide some culture tour too. But these are not actually possible right now. So what we're preparing is a VR hospital tour like this. So since we cannot invite these people and uh, share our expertise, this is what we are preparing. So we are hospital tour, we are making it, I think we are gonna launch this sometime in next, uh, um, next uh, spring. So I hope we are, we will able to share this, uh, a lot of people, um, I mean, uh, doctors and uh, public health workers uh, in the APO. And this is uh, just to show the smart war that we have. So this is a global education platform. Uh, we have this uh, 4K camera and this system. And actually uh, this is a, a uh, the procedure done in our smart OR, and we do real time biopsy and uh, pathology tests, and then communicate through uh, this uh, screen. And also, this is Oita University doing vulture discussion during the um, uh, procedure. Uh, and then, one last thing um, I know a lot of hospitals have these clinical programs, but what I want to empathize, especially with APO, is that it's not just clinical programs, but we do have. Uh, programs for hospital management as well. Um, so we actually had a CEO Leadership Academy in the past, uh, in the fall, around more than 100 people from Moscow hospital CEOs have visited our hospital and did one week programs. And also Moscow Nursing Leadership Academy was done in last year. But uh, again, for, from, because of COVID-19, we're not doing it right now. And we're thinking of preparing as a virtual program. So I hope uh, we will have chance to share this uh, with people who have attended today. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Lee. So uh, that is a glimpse of what uh, the uh, national, uh, the Seoul National University Gundang Hospital uh, will be able to offer to the member countries. Uh, we understand that the the needs and the requirements for each member country may differ from one country to another. And therefore, we may have to uh, customize or tailor the approach. In an ideal situation, if we were to be able to travel, uh, we would uh, certainly uh, be able to invite and dispatch a delegation and missions uh, from the member countries to visit uh, Dr. Lee's hospital. But for the time being, uh, we need to delay this option. But nonetheless, uh, you know, we, there are, uh, we, we will be able to uh, share and uh, Dr. Lee and the team would be willing uh, to share the experiences uh, according to your need. So uh, I, I will open again for question and answer. Uh, uh, to anybody who would like to, uh, do, to learn more from Dr. Lee at this opportunity. Uh, Mr. SG, if Iran is uh, possible, Iran ask a question. Yes, please. And afterwards, I want to ask a question. Okay. Yeah, okay. Then Iran, go ahead. For your comprehensive presentation, I have two questions. Uh, from your presentation, uh, uh, do you uh, believe a uh, lockdown strategy in this situation? And um, uh, um, please explain about this strategy in this situation in Iran or other country that uh, similar uh, similar. And to, uh, and second question, uh, please explain me uh, us about um, use. Uh, um, uh, people in uh, voluntary groups to reduce uh, this. Uh, uh, this is uh, and uh, uh, is, is it important in uh, this situation? Uh, so I think I got the first question about lockdown. But uh, for the question too, 
Uh, Mr. Secretary, do you think, can you elaborate for me or? Uh, yes, uh, if I, this, uh, it is actually the role, the, uh, the significance of a voluntary group uh -huh. in, in, in uh, you know, uh, the, you, you, because you talk about civic awareness and everything, yes, yes. Uh, but I think uh, the question from Iran was about the voluntary contribution. Yes, yes. Thank yeah. you. Thank you very much. So for the first in lockdown, uh, basically, we did not uh, put in lockdown strategy uh, from the beginning. And uh, even now we are not doing it. So um, yes, lockdown will be very effective for sure. But I think it has a lot of side effects. Um, we have seen uh, when lockdown in Wuhan happened, Wuhan people were having very hard time in China. So I think uh, for now, a lot of evidence says that wearing masking and social distance itself is very effective for prevention of transmission. So uh, rather than lockdown, I would emphasize more in mask wearing and social distancing because lockdown has a lot of uh, side effects uh, for not just the disease itself, but, to, but also for the uh, economy as well. And for the second question, I think a voluntary group definitely uh, works in this kind of situation because if uh, in this kind of pandemic, um, often the medical healthcare system is overwhelmed and a lot of times it will not be covered only by existing uh, healthcare professionals. So definitely in this kind of situation, I think with education, uh, ha having a voluntary group for the support of this COVID-19 testing and everything, I think that uh, definitely works. The second question about yeah. the, vo the voluntary. Yes, voluntary, I, I just uh, briefly mentioned, I think uh, voluntary group, I think that's uh, uh, definitely necessary because yeah. there is a limitation of healthcare worker in this kind of pandemic situation. Yes, definitely, if possible, we have to utilize this kind of uh, voluntary, voluntary people. Um, I think that there are some questions who's what's in the chatting um, screen. Uh, screen. Uh, let, let us check from the uh, chat. Okay. Ayube Kushchen from Bangladesh. Okay, Bangladesh. Yes. And then uh, Thailand wanted to ask question. Can I give it to uh, Thailand first before Bangladesh? Yes, yes. sure. Thailand. Rachada, was it was it from you? If not, then I go to Bangladesh first. Bangladesh, please. Uh, yes. Uh, hello. Uh, this is Priti Chakraborty from Bangladesh. Yes. Uh, I, I run a medical college hospital at the same time a member of our Ministry of Industry. Uh, I shall have to run COVID hospital also with my hospital because our government uh, has, uh, give, has instructed us to start COVID hospital. Uh, who has got the hospital above, uh, that is more than 50 beds. So as we have got 350 bedded hospitals, so we, share, we started our COVID hospital and then we uh, worked with our government very strongly. Uh, my question is that uh, uh, you have uh, managed your Korean situation, Korean hospitals and your uh, health situation very uh, good. And also, you know that uh, Bangladesh also has controlled COVID uh, very successfully. Uh, my question uh, to you, uh, Doctor, two questions. One question is, we have seen in our country that this COVID uh, was uh, not seen in the um, slum areas, in the um, little bit poor families. Uh, what do you think? My question, first question is, and second question, uh, that is winter is coming. So our prime minister is very much, uh, uh, very much worried, and she's been instructed without mask, no service in anywhere, in anywhere in the country. So we are following that instruction. But I, I can see in my hospital, that is the number of COVID patients decreasing. Um, just two, three days back, it is increasing again. Uh, little bit increasing, not too much. But what do you think from your experience that is as winter is coming, so what you should do, how we can 
uh, run our covid hospitals and situations how we can control our situation thank you okay. um i'm going to i so I under i understood the set uh, no, second question completely but the first question mr secker can you elaborate a little bit for me the first uh, one yeah, Dr. Lee, uh, in the case of uh, perhaps Bangladesh and perhaps also other countries, the spread or the uh, cases are also prevalent into this, uh, what we call uh, poor areas, the slum areas. Uh, so there is a tendency perhaps of uh, a high uh, cases in those area. So uh, perhaps then how do we prevent? Yes, um, I think the first question is very hard question. Actually, that's uh, because basically this virus uh, very easily spread through a very close context. And I know um, this uh, area where people, poor people lives, uh, or I mean, a lot of family members actually are in, you know, very close contact uh, together. And many people live in small areas as well. Um, but the, uh, uh, excuse me. I uh. Sorry, I, I had a actually procedure starting. So, so anyway, yeah, yeah, yeah I'm can, very can sorry. I just, but, my question so, was like that. My question was, we, we have seen, we have observed that uh, in Bangladesh, this yeah. group was uh, not uh, seen in the slum areas. So what is your idea? Why? So, yeah, I, I mean, I, I know your question, but it's, I think it's very challenging. And then I think uh, preventing one, if one family member gets, gets COVID-19, I think it's going to be nearly impossible to prevent um, the, among these um, uh, family members. So I think the best way, maybe best might measure can be the court uh, isolation. If one member or some member in the area is in infected, then doing court isolation might be probably the only way to minimize the spread to the other uh, part of the slum area. Then that's answer number one. And number two, you talked about winter is coming. Uh, so at the very beginning, uh, experts were talking about this uh, seasonality and they expected this might go down if the summer comes. But it doesn't really seem like the case. It's not like uh, influenza. And I think even uh, winter comes, I don't think winter itself will make, not make any kind of, uh, you know, additional, uh, you know, surge for the uh, COVID-19. Uh, and so far what we have seen is that uh, in this early time of year, actually mm -hmm. by wearing mask, yeah. uh, decrease influenza in, uh, infection rate dramatically. In mm -hmm. fact, in our hospital, it, just went down more than half. And nowadays it's really hard to see influenza cases. So I think even winter comes, I don't think uh, the weather itself will have any influence. Just if we maintain what we're doing like social distancing and wearing mask, I don't think we need any other additional measure uh, specifically for the winter. Dr. Lee, thank you very much. How is your time? I Thank you very much. I think I may have uh, five minutes. I have a patient waiting for the uh, procedure. So I think I have five minutes. Okay, uh, that's last question. I, I'm sorry, I was mistaken. Uh, it was perhaps ROC instead of Thailand. Shirley, are you having any question? ROC, are you there? Can you unmute? Yes. Uh, it's okay. So if we have uh, any further question, maybe we can send to uh, APO Secretariat by email. Okay, we'll do that. Uh, well, I think I will uh, better uh, wrap up. And uh, as I said, this is basically a glimpse of what uh, the experiences of Korea. And I hope this, the member countries might well, find it useful and relevant uh, for uh, the cases and the situation in the member countries or their respective countries. 
what we would like to uh, go from here is actually later on we will arrange. We have received about uh, 10 or 11 member countries expressing interest. But I need to work out with the uh, Dr. Lee and Dr. Uetsuka uh, how on how we may be able to uh, to to work it out, uh, bearing in mind also the specific uh, condition and and your needs. Just one last uh, point uh, that we will also be featuring a presentation from the Republic of China. So uh, we will are preparing and uh, we will inform the member countries. So then we will, we, can be, we will be able to see the experiences of Japan, the experiences of Korea, as well as the experiences of the ROC. And in closing, I would like to kindly request Dr. Won Jae Lee, if I may have your confirmation to share the PowerPoint slides to the member countries. So uh, they will be able to go through more uh, in detail the presentation. May I have your concurrence to do that? We will, we will uh, share it from our side. So uh, I would suggest that uh, uh, Mr. Buana will convert the, the uh, final slide to PDF and I'm happy to share it with all the member countries. Yes, we will wait for you. Uh, for your uh, for the final slides, and then uh, we will we will uh, later on uh, come back to the member countries with the uh, the the slide that will be finalized by Dr. Lee, and Dr. Lee will uh, send it to us, and we will distribute to all the member countries. Uh, thank you very much again, uh, Dr. Won Jae Lee, and I would like also to especially thanks our NPOs and all. Uh, the uh, guests and our partners from the different medical institutions in the member countries. And I sincerely hope that the presentation has been useful. And please uh, follow up uh, with, uh, we have a contact person, uh, Mr. Arsoni Buana. He will be our contact person. And Sony will follow up with you and contact and uh, liaise and coordinate uh, uh, so that we can uh, move it forward. So thank you so much, Dr. Lee. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank, thank, you. thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, thank you everyone. Thank you, everyone.